Sam's inaugural uh, Investor Day presentation. We're delighted to present uh, the edible nuts and spices and vegetable ingredients team to you today. Uh, in terms of format, we'll start off with opening remarks by Shekhar, uh, Executive Director, Finance and Business Development, after which the Edible Nuts team will present their business to you. Uh, we'll take your questions after that. Uh, the second session would be Spices and Vegetable Ingredients, um, after which we'll break for lunch. So with that, uh, welcome and over to Shekhar for opening remarks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. To all those who made it here, a big thank you. And for all those who will see this uh, live uh, after we put it up on our website, uh, a good morning or good evening wherever you are. Uh, very pleased to have all of you here uh, for what's the first of this kind uh, presentations that we had uh, announced that we will be doing for all our business platforms, business segments. As you're aware, we uh, uh, announce our results in five reporting segments and we thought that as part of this format we'll do a deep dive into each segment and maybe some of the segments we'll need to do over two formats but that's really the plan and in addition to this we have also announced some site visits wherein you can see the strategy live on the ground in terms of the physical brick and mortar assets as well as the people so what we tried to do today is to bring the senior leadership team of these two platforms, and you are aware that these are uh, fairly large platforms, uh, which we expect to, which in which we have made a lot of investments, and we expect to invest and grow in the coming years. So uh, both these uh, segments are important. They are also complex in that that they are not just one product; they are a set of and a portfolio of products. So what we would like to really use these platform sessions is to open up. The fact that uh, so one part of the complexity of our business uh, that most of our stakeholders have talked about is a lot of moving parts. And how we really plan, how we strategize, how we really think about our businesses is at the platform level. So the three things that we want to kind of bring to life and hopefully uh, through these platform sessions is what is really the strategy, the core strategy that is driving? How have the portfolio of assets and capabilities been selected? And how does each platform populate this over a period of time? What have we done in the last three to five years? And what do we intend to do in the next three years? So that is the core strategy that really drives our business and part of that in terms of the corporate overall corporate strategy. So hopefully through this session, you will get a glimpse of what, what is the link or what is the thread that drives these number of initiatives that you see getting populated through the course of every year and hopefully you'll see the link within each platform. The second aspect that we want to talk about is really while we've made a lot of investments, what kind of impact these investments are having in terms of our competitive position. And you'll see this reflected in these two platforms and in the others that will follow that over what we have invested in the last four to five years and fairly aggressively at that, there is a very, very strong competitive position that we have built in these platforms and there is a structural story in these platforms that we are backing and it's not just a set of random opportunities that we kind of put together or participated in. So there is a strategic uh, part and then there is the kind of competitive position that we have built through what we have done and what we hope to kind of build upon in the coming years. And the last and probably the most important part which can never be probably expressed in any webcast or any presentation is the depth and the spread of the management team. And again, today, the people who will be in front of you and talking about their businesses are just one small component of the teams that have been built in these businesses. But that's really what transforms these strategic ideas and these so-called theoretical competitive positions into real life, into real execution, and hopefully into real money and shareholder value. And today, I think uh, each platform is going to talk about the way they have built these businesses. Some have been uh, through let's say the old organic investment that Olam has made, a lot with new talent and capabilities that we have hired, and a lot that have been acquired. And how we blend these together and how we extract the synergies out of this is probably another glimpse that we'd like to try and give it to you. So really these platform presentations are about understanding the core platform strategy, understanding the kind of competitive position that we have built or in the process of building, 
and looking at the deep organizational processes and bench strength that we have built in each platform, which will hopefully enable execution in the coming years. So uh, without further ado, this is a day, and I'm most pleased about this day because I don't need to speak at all. After this, I'm going to join you and potentially ask questions to the team also. But uh, I'd like to end by introducing the team leaders for the two platforms today. Uh, so in the center is Ashok Krishan, uh, and an old Olamite, and I'm not talking about his age. He's, uh, this is his 22nd year in Olam, and during this period, uh, so he's kind of one of the founding members uh, of Olam. Uh, during this period, he has done multiple roles. He started in Nigeria like most of us did at that time, and then was uh, also set up our, uh, uh, the next countries that we uh, developed in Benin, in Ghana, and Cameroon, was involved in West Africa for about five or six years. Moved to Singapore uh, after we moved our head office here and was looking at the global <coughs> businesses of rice and sugar, so ran those platforms. Went back into country management as the regional head of India, and then came back again and over the last 10 years has been uh, heading the or stewarding the uh, edible nuts business, which has grown from just being a cashew business into a multi-product, multi-segment, multi-value chain business, one of our uh, largest businesses today. Uh, he will obviously um, introduce the rest of his team. Uh, another couple of things about Ashok that you should probably know. He has, as part of uh, being a founding member of the executive committee of Olam, has been there ever since it was created. He has also uh, headed our, uh, as a chairman of our Human Resource Committee, uh, and uh, is currently a member of the Strategy Committee uh, of the Exco. So that's Ashok, and he will talk about his team. I'd also like to introduce uh, Greg Estep, uh, President uh, of our global global head of our Spice and Vegetable Ingredients team. Greg joined us uh, three years ago with the Gilroy acquisition. He was the president of Gilroy Foods uh, as part of Conagra. Has had uh, 27 or 28 years experience in the industry. Uh, worked with Continental Grain, worked with Conagra, worked on core commodities, grains, oil seeds, freight, uh, has run global freight books, has lived in Asia prior to this, and is now based out of Fresno, which is the global head office of our spice and vegetable ingredients group. Uh, again, uh, Greg, and, uh, Greg and Olam, or we go back <laughs> a while ago, even before the Gilroy acquisition, and we used to compete with each other. And looking at his size, we decided it's better to have him on this side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> and um, really, the, 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 the rationale for the whole Gilroy acquisition was led by uh, probably both the Gilroy and Olam teams truly understanding what the businesses m could mean if they combined together. And so what a Gilroy could not do as part of Conagra, no, it was nothing to do about Conagra. It was just about the Gilroy business and Olam business are suited, and to be able to take it globally is probably what uh, Greg will talk about. So Greg, uh, when he joined for the first year, was heading the spice vegetable ingredient business that we bought from Gilroy. But um, uh, uh, in about 12 months after joining, he took over as the head of our entire spice vegetable ingredients group. So combining Olam's erstwhile spice vegetable ingredients group into the Gilroy and making it one single structure, which again, Greg will talk about. So uh, with that, I'll hand over uh, to the two teams to take you through this platform. Again, this is the start of a process. It's not that we're going to end this after this. There are multiple platforms that are going to come. And then by which time the platforms would have done new things, and we'll probably continue this as a process. So we are trying to give as much as we can in this session. But this is, I'd again like to stress, it's the start of a process. And based on the feedback that we get, from these uh, presentations, we will kind of uh, try and improve that and make this more usable and uh, useful for you. Thank you, and hope you have a productive uh, morning. Morning, ladies and morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the world of nuts, which I'm going to talk to you about in a short while. But before I do that, uh, thank you, Shekhar, for the generous introduction. Uh, much appreciated. I don't really deserve all what Shekhar said. You know, I'm just an ordinary guy trying to make uh, Olam a better company every day. So uh, just to quickly introduce you to the team, uh, starting from uh, the first person on my right, Damien Hulahan. Uh, he heads 
the Australian arm and business for us, uh, and which is a very large part of the platform, which I will talk to you about in a short while. Uh, Damon has got about 23 years of experience in the, uh, in the commodity industry. He was earlier working with Cargill and uh, finally with Queensland Cotton, which we acquired. And from Queensland Cotton, handling cotton, he has now moved on to handling the almond business. He's got a wide experience in terms of uh, moving across commodities. And now he heads the Australian almond business for us uh, in Australia, ba based out of Brisbane. Moving on, we have uh, Dave DeFrank, an ag veteran. I think Dave started uh, in the ag industry when he was probably 14 or 15, you know. And in those days, I don't think in the United States, uh, they really had any such thing as child labor or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So he's a veteran in the ag industry, about 30, 30, 32 years of experience. Uh, he was also part of the Queensland Cotton team uh, when we acquired Queensland Cotton, very quickly moved on to establishing the almond business for us. He also contributed significantly in the spices, in growing the spices and vegetable business uh, in, in uh, California. And he's the man behind getting us uh, the almond orchards in California. And he is now the head of the uh, U.S. almond business. Moving on, we have uh, Amit Kirbat. Amit is a true and true Olamite. He's, uh, he's been with us uh, for, for close to 15 years, out and out a cashew man. Uh, right from his beginning of his career with Olam, he's been in the cashew business. I don't think we have a better expert in cashews than Amit. Uh, to, to talk to you about the cashew business a little later during the day. We have Anupam Jindal next to Amit Kirwat. Anupam, again, is a, is a peanut veteran. He's been in Olam also for about 15 years. Uh, long experience, uh, handled the cashew business initially for some time as a trader, moved on to handling the peanut business. He heads the global peanut business for us, uh, and he will talk to you about the peanuts uh, business shortly. Uh, I forgot to mention, Amit heads the global cashew business for us. We have uh, a couple of other people, uh, a few people who are also the senior leadership team, uh, but we felt, uh, and, and we, fo we form what we call the management committee of the nuts, the, so we call it the nuts mancom. Uh, collectively, we are 10 of us. Uh, we proudly also call ourselves uh, 10, which is team edible nuts. And uh, for some of you uh, who are interested in soccer or cricket, uh, Lionel Messi wears the number 10, the most valuable player. Similarly, you have Maradona, who used to wear the number 10. Sachin Tendulkar, who's a cricketer, one of the best cricketers we have in the world, wears the jersey number 10. And therefore, 10 on 10, which is team edible nuts. With that introduction, I'll move on to giving you a view of what the edible nuts business is all about. So once again, welcome to the world of nuts. Did you know that nuts are a healthy snack? Did you know that nuts are zero cholesterol? Did you know that nuts are a low glycemic index food, which means that you eat a handful of nuts, you feel full for a longer time. And now there is a diet which has come out, nut-based diet, wherein it is recommended that you have half an ounce of nuts half an hour before you have a meal. It fills you and therefore you eat less of your meal and therefore you can lose weight. Nuts are heart friendly. Every nut that you consume does good for your heart. It increases your HDL and reduces your LDL. That's what nuts is all about. And therefore, it is one of the most healthiest snacks that you can ever have. While it's a snack, you can also see, you can see that nut applications go across not only snacks, but across various ingredient segments. You can find them in breakfast cereals, you can find them in confectionery. So when you eat a chocolate, while some of you may think that the chocolate is not very good for your health, but if it has nuts, obviously it's again healthy for you. It goes into energy bars, which is the low glycemic index property, and therefore having an energy bar before you go for uh, running a marathon, I'm sure you will do a better time than what you would have otherwise. So that's about the various applications. Where do you find these? You find it in all the multinational brands in their products worldwide. And most of these you see on the slide, they're all our customers as well. So you can see the multiple applications for nuts that you can see on this. This is almond milk, which is also considered to be very healthy. Yeah, you, this, these are chocolates, Hershey chocolates, you have, you have nuts in them. You have, uh, you name the product here, it's got nuts in the product to make it more healthy, as a healthy snack or a, as a healthy ingredient. If you thought the nuts business was a very small business globally, and why is Olam participating in this? Why are we not trying to become big like in the grains business or in the, 
and the uh, various other large ag space businesses. The nuts is a $34 billion industry. It's a huge industry, and as you can see, each of the nuts, main nuts that, that form part of the edible nuts portfolio, we have walnuts, we have almonds, we have cashews, we have hazelnuts, we have pistachios, all of them are roughly about $5 billion in, 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 at the commodity level. I'm not talking about the retail pack level, that could be much more. And if you see, the total volume in nuts is about 7.5 million metric tons in kernel terms. And of which peanut, which is a, in, consumed as an, as an ingredient and as a processed snack, it's about 4 million. Anupam will tell you more about the peanut business in terms of what the total volumes of peanuts are. If you look at the edible nuts value chain, it's pretty much the same way you process nuts across all the nuts that we have, whether it's almonds or whether it's cashews or whether it's peanuts or whether it's hazelnuts, all nuts go through a similar process. There is a farming and a plantation part of it. Yeah, only, only peanuts are farmed, all the others are plantation nuts. When we mean plantation nuts, they are slightly long gestation. They take three to five years to get the first yield, and then they come to full yield between seven and 10 years, and they last 25 to 30 years, and some of the pistachio trees and walnut trees last 100 years, right? And peanut is a row crop, it's farmed annually. Other than that, everything else is a plantation nut. It goes through a process of shelling, because it comes to the shell, you have to shell, remove the shell. Then it goes through a process of blanching, it's got an inner skin. Imagine your peanut, it's got an inner, inner red skin or brown skin, whatever you call it, you can peel it very easily. In some of the nuts like cashew, you can't peel it very easily. So that has to also go through a process. Similarly with almonds, or similarly, the almond skin is very difficult to remove. So that's the process we call blanching. Either from the raw kernels or the blanched kernels, it can go into multiple applications, it can go into multiple ways. You first obviously clean it, then you can either roast it, you can granulate it. If you roast it, you can have your snacks. Salted, dry roasted, oil roasted, salted or coated, you can have after roasting, then or you could granulate, you could make paste and butter, you could get oil extracts. We should also add, you can make almond milk, which is another product. And then this crushing finally only applies to peanuts, where you make peanut oil. Peanut oil is 50% is of the consumption of total peanuts. Pe uh, peanuts are consumed 50% as peanut oil, which you will also hear about. So the point I want to make here on the slide is, every nut is processed in a similar way, and therefore, when you build capabilities, in one nut, you can transfer that learning to another nut in terms of the capabilities and skills that you need to be able to process any nut. So if you're able to process cashews, you can very easily fungibly transfer the skills to be able to process an almond or a peanut or, or, or a, a hazelnut and so on and so forth. So that is a brief history about the world of nuts and what, what is nuts and what is the size and how is the, how is the industry uh, positioned. Now I will take you through what is our global footprint in, in this large space of nuts. You can see that we are present almost in every continent as far as the nuts are concerned. If you look at almonds, we are in, we are in California, we are in Australia. If you look at cashews, we are, in, we are in India, we are in Vietnam, we are in Africa. Africa is a large producing country of, uh, large uh, producing continent of cashews. Then we have uh, hazelnuts in Turkey. And we have peanuts in, 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 in the US, we have peanuts in China, we have peanuts in Argentina, we have peanuts in India and South Africa as well. So we pretty much encompass the globe in terms of where these four nuts that we participate in are grown. It is an attractive growth platform for us. Out of the $34 billion of sales of nuts, we participate in $22 billion in these four nuts. Like I to refresh you, all these nuts, whether it's cashews, almonds, peanuts, or hazelnuts, they're all in excess of $5 billion, with peanuts being a little bit more. We have a global leadership in all these businesses because we participate in at least 80% of the producing countries in, in, the, in these commodities, as you saw in the, in the map in the previous slide. We have a strong customer franchise. We have customers with us for the last 20 years. When we started off in the cashew business, as Sunny must have told you, or Shaker has told you so many times, we started off the cashew business from Nigeria. One product, one country, four customers, and that was cashew. Yeah? So we have customers going 20 years with us, and we have a strong customer, customer franchise. We are integrated from the farm to the customer. In most of the businesses in the edible nuts, we are an integrated player. We do the farming. We do the supply chain part of it in terms of primary processing. We do the midstream, which is what we call value-added processing, converting it to an ingredient 
which goes into all the bakery applications or confectionery or so on and so forth. So we are integrated, we are integrated from farm to the customer. Like I mentioned earlier, we have an experienced leadership team. The, the top 10 guys, we have a combined cumulative experience of about 175 years in the commodity industry and in the nut industry. Moving on to cashew, we are a leading cashew player with a 20% market share. We have presence in all the cashew producing countries. We process, and the only processor, Amit will tell you a little bit more about it, we are the only processor spread across multiple locations compared to our competition which are present either only in India or in Vietnam or in Brazil. We are the only ones who are present across multiple geographies converting the raw cashew nut into blanched kernels to be able to supply to our customer. It has a lot of its advantages, we'll come to that in a bit. We are the number one peanut blancher in the US and number one ingredient manufacturer of peanut paste roasted granulates in the United States. And we are the only one present in five countries. Every other competitor of ours is present only in one country, either in the US or in Argentina or in China or in India. We are the number two almond gro grower globally. We own the number two orchards in terms of size globally as far as almonds are concerned in Australia and in, in California. The only player in the industry, again, to repeat, with a presence both in Australia and in the United States, whereas most of our competition are present only in one of these countries. We are the top three hazelnut supplier today to the industry, to the confectionery industry. I'll talk a little bit more about it when, when I present on the hazelnuts. If you see, this chart is about our volumes. Where are we sourcing it from for all these four nuts? Where, are we, where is our destination market? And you can pretty much see that we are spread across, which is another pictorial representation of pretty much evenly spread across multiple geographies. United States being a large one of where we source the product, and United States being a large market for us, Europe being a large market. So United States and Europe are large markets for nut consumption. Where do we participate in this business? If you look at the peanut business, so you've, you've pretty much heard, of, heard about our story how we look at the value chain. We look at it as an upstream, we look at it as, as the OLAM core, which is the supply chain part of it, the midstream and the downstream. By downstream, we mean getting into contract manufacturing uh, for our customers and not really getting into the brands. We are the brand behind the brands, as we've probably stated so many times. In the peanut business, we are present in Argentina, as you can see, both in the upstream. We do farming ourselves and we are also present in the supply chain. Because of our presence in the U.S. ingredients, we very easily can see that we can get into midstream ingredient manufacturing in, in Argentina, and we can also do that in China, South Africa, and India. So that's how we can be fungible and transfer our learning. So that's the future plan. The, the light green is what we, expect, what we expect to do in the future as far as the value chain is concerned, and the yellows are where we want to get into new nut opportunities. Moving on, if you see the cashew business, we are present in India, Vietnam, Africa. We are in the supply chain. You must notice here that we are not in the farming, in the upstream. I will leave it to Amit to tell you as to why we are not there in the upstream, in cashews, while we want to be in the upstream, while we want to do the plantation business in almonds, or for that matter, in walnuts or pistachios. You can see that even in hazelnuts, we do not want to be there. We want to get into new origins, not in the existing origin. In the almond business, we are fully integrated right from the upstream to the supply chain to the midstream. And Finally, the new nut opportunities for us are getting into pecans, walnuts, and pistachios in the future when we find the opportunity. But again, pistachios and walnuts, you will see that we would like to be only in the upstream and the supply chain because the plantation economics are good for us in, in the business like it is in almonds. The grower, because it is in the developed world for almonds or pistachios or walnuts, he appropriates maximum amount of the profit pool which is available in the supply chain or in the entire value chain. As you've heard uh, Sunny saying this, uh, uh, many times during some of our uh, uh, results announcements. Finally, the global footprint in our nuts, nut-wise, as I call it, in cashews, we are present in seven origin countries. We, are, we have 20 processing facilities. We are in mechanical cashew processing. We have a cashew ingredient manufacturing facility. We employ close to 23,000 people on a seasonal basis, on an indirect basis. Uh, and that's not counted out of the 18,000 people that Olam talks about employing globally. This is beyond that 18,000 people in the cashew business because cashews essentially involve a lot of labor. It's a very supple nut 
It's a very complicated nut to process, and therefore you need to process every single cashew which you will consume here, which is left there for you, has been processed by one person with her or his hands. And therefore, OLAM's endeavor is to see how we can mechanize this process so that we are able to scale this. We'll talk a lot about that in the coming slides. We have seven marketing offices. We are the only, probably the only nut player with so many marketing offices. Everybody else operates from their from their origin. We want to be closer to the customer, and therefore we felt that we have to be present where the customer is. We have 34 own manufacturing plants. Like I said, we do about 40,000 hectares of farming and about 26,000 and 3,200 direct employees. With that brief overview of our global footprint, I would like to take you now to the next section where I will have my colleagues presenting to you each of the nuts. We will start with almonds. Moving on, to, uh, moving on to cashews, peanuts, and then hazelnuts. So I would like to invite Damien Hulahan to talk to you a little bit more about the almond business and give you a deep dive on the almond business. Damien, over to you. Thanks, Thanks Ashok. Uh, welcome, everyone, and welcome to the, to, to the wonderful world of almonds. The next, uh, the next three slides um, is going to give you a really good um, reason why we bounce out of bed every morning in the almond business. Uh, what we see in the almond business is very robust fundamentals uh, that uh, really make us excited to be in this business. This slide here is uh, just showing a, a quick snapshot of the demand um, in, in 2012, this is by container, which is about 44,000 pounds per container, um, <clears throat> and where that demand fell in, um, in 2012. As you can see, big markets in, um, in, whoops, sorry, in uh, North America, uh, big markets in, in, in China, Middle East, um, and, uh, and Japan, and then obviously Western Europe as well is the, is, is the second largest market. But what this also shows, if you look at the, uh, <clears throat> the table down here, is the significant demand headroom that we see, particularly in the emerging markets. As you can see uh, on per capita consumption by, by grams, uh, in, the, uh, in the developed markets such as USA and Australia and Germany, it's around between 700 to 1,000 grams uh, per year. But if you look at these uh, developing markets such as uh, Eastern Europe and Russia, Middle East, India and China, it's, it's really just a very small fraction of the demand that we see in, uh, in, the, in the more developed, um, developed markets. Uh, <clears throat> you know, and certainly one of the reasons that we're seeing, we're seeing um, <clears throat> this, this trend, we're seeing these, these markets starting to move significantly towards this, but with a hell of a long way to go. And, and a big reason for that is obviously the health message, the rising middle class in these, in these countries, the more sophisticated diets, the, the, the greater demand for protein, and that's resonating through to <coughs> significant demand upticks, um, which I'll illustrate on the next, the next slide, the next couple of slides. So just quickly, a couple of more statistics. This is a consumption snapshot that, uh, again, which is just illustrating on a, in, in a pie form what you just saw in the global, the global chart, where that demand lies as far as the spread of, uh, of locations. Um, what we've seen between 2007 and 2012 is about a 10% double-digit growth uh, per annum for, for uh, almond demand. Um, <coughs> and as I said, the increase is being driven by acceptance um, for, for almonds in the snack nut, the health message. There has been a lot of good um, uh, marketing, particularly done by the Californian Almond Board as well, as their supply has grown quite substantially. Uh, um, and we've seen, we've seen that the domestic, um, the domestic market also in the U.S. grow by double digits as well. Production snapshot, as you can see, it's very heavily dominated by California. Um, <coughs> another uh, you know, key takeaway here from an Australian perspective is that this year we, we overtook Spain as the number two producer globally, albeit very small but significant. As far as, the, as far as the trade is concerned, uh, as you can see, we've seen substantial growth in the, 
In the developing markets, China's up around about eight times, Middle East over three times since 2007. EU has been relatively stable, but what we're seeing definitely in Eastern Europe is, is a significant increase in demand. For instance, Russia is up around about 20 per cent this year, uh, the Ukraine as well. Um, <clears throat> so even though the EU has been fairly stable, that's more from a Western uh, European standpoint. Uh, India, a very significant market, particularly for Australian Inshell, has shown significant demand as well. From a pricing perspective, um, you know, certainly the, the, uh, the demand profile and the increase in demand and actually a convergence between the abundant supply curves over the last couple of years has obviously <coughs> translated into what you would expect with commodities um, an increase in, in the price. This is non parel Supreme 23.25, which is essentially the base grade in which the market is, is, um, <coughs> is quoted. We've seen a good trend upwards over the last five years, as we've seen that demand increase that, uh, that I illustrated earlier. For the most part, we've seen supply keep up with demand, and it needed to do that. Most of that supply has come out of California, obviously, as you saw earlier. But also, we've seen a, um, <coughs> a doubling in supply out of Australia as, as orchards that were planted in 2001, 2 and 2006, 7, where the main plantings in Australia have come into maturity as well. So what's the long-term trends in, in, in almonds? What are we seeing? As, as, I, as I mentioned, we're obviously seeing very robust demand fundamentals. There's no doubt about that, and it's extremely exciting. Um, supply has been keeping pace for the most part. We've taken actually a bit of a pause this year, but to be honest, the, the, the market needed to do that. Um, Double-digit growth uh, was going to mean that if that continued, the world was going to run out of almonds as early as next year. Um, so we've seen a little bit of a pause in demand, driven by price a little bit, as it should, but um, certainly we, 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 we see it continuing, uh, you know, essentially all, along the same vein as we, we saw over the last five years. Um, almonds, we're seeing a lot of that demand coming through from a snack nut perspective. Almond is, almonds are quite unique across the edible nuts profile that essentially up until now it's been really a 50-50 split from a demand perspective between the ingredients and snack nuts, but we're certainly starting to see a good increase in, in snack nut um, <coughs> demand in recent times. Again, the health message, but also to almonds, actually has been very competitively priced against other snack nuts such as cashews and, and pistachios and pecans and walnuts and, what, and, and, and so forth. Um, no doubt with, with the robust demand fundamentals and the increase in the, in the US dollar price for almond, uh, almonds over the last five years, we're certainly seeing a trend towards higher asset values in this space. And we, we certainly uh, consider that that trend will continue. Some opportunities for, for OLAM. Well, we really need to get to full capacity on our yields on our orchards in, in Australia and the US, and we're certainly doing that. The, the orchards in Australia, for instance, are looking fantastic and are, and are yielding exceptionally well this year. Um, we're looking at value-add opportunities in Australia. We've recently, as I'm sure you're all, all aware, um, made a significant investment in first hulling and shelling and first stage processing in Australia. We'll certainly look at second stage processing down the road as well. Um, we're going to expand into new markets as we, as we increase our trading volumes out of the US. Um, uh, certainly our trading business in the U.S. is very complementary to our increase in our, in our orchard acres, and that is going extremely well for us, and we see great opportunity to, to build on that business. And also we're looking at unlocking some of the value in our orchards in Australia with, with sale and leaseback op, uh, opportunities along similar lines that you're aware of in, in, uh, in California. Obviously, even though, as I said, you know, I think I've painted a very robust industry and demand picture, um, there, there are obviously challenges. Um, weather and drought risk, you know, we're in upstream, so weather is, is a big part uh, of, uh, of, of a risk that we have to, we have to deal with. Um, we're making significant investments in our orchard portfolio on precision farming techniques, using GPS, um, <coughs> using software programs, cutting edge software programs, um, <coughs> and, and really looking at uh, extracting um, great value out of what we're doing on, on farm, but, but also reducing our risk to, uh, to some of the weather impacts. 
And as I said, you know, certainly, certainly with the increase in asset value, um, we want to continue to increase our, our orchard portfolio in California, um, but, uh, but uh, that will be challenging for us um, due, to, uh, due to that asset uh, increase profile that we've seen in recent years. So I'll, I'll, leave, that, uh, I'll leave it there, um, and I'll, I'll certainly hand on to Armit now for, for, to give you a bit of a, a rundown of the, ca uh, the cashew business, but I'll also leave you with a couple of uh, uh, interesting facts in, in, in relation to our Armit orchards in Australia, just to give you some sort of uh, idea, I guess, of, of the significant scale of the business. It's a huge business. Um, it's a great business for us. Um, but uh, as you can see, there's some fairly significant facts there that hopefully give it some sort of perspective for you. Thank you. Thanks, Damien. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I will take you through Olam's cashew business in more detail. Here is a cashew fruit as it grows on a tree. What is so peculiar about this? The cashew fruit is the only fruit which has the seed outside the fruit. You would have seen mangoes where the seed is inside, but in a cashew the seed is outside. And what we all eat is the seed, raw seed, which grows outside the fruit. This is what we eat after shelling. Moving on to global statistics, this slide will give you an overview of the global cashew crop and where it is processed across the globe. The first column here shows you that 2.3 million tons of raw cashews are grown in the world. Obviously, the same quantity is processed, but processed in different origins and countries, not where they are grown. The cashew crop has doubled over the last 12 years. But in the last few years, we have observed that the crop is stagnating across most origins, except for Guinea-Bissau and Ivory Coast in Africa. All other origins, the crops are barely growing. In fact, in some countries like Brazil, the, crops are, the cashew crop is coming down. A couple of important points to note here. Asia grows 43% of the global cashew crop, but processes 81% of the crop, which is mainly India and Vietnam. West Africa grows 35% of the global crop, but processes only 3.6% of the global cashew crop. The yield from a raw cashew to a cashew kernel which we eat, eat is just 20 to 25%, which means that about a million tons of raw cashews are transported across Africa to India and Vietnam, incurring freight and wasting 75% of the freight. What it means, it makes clear sense to process in Africa. That's one key point which comes out of this. Olam presents in this slide. We are present in India. We are present in Vietnam. We are present in Nigeria, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Mozambique, and Tanzania. These are the seven countries where we are present in cashews, which are the largest producing countries. Except for Ghana, in all other countries, we have processing facilities in six countries. And if you see in West Africa, most of this processing capacity out of the 30 and 40,000 tons in Nigeria and Ivory Coast is ours. So we are pioneering the effort in terms of processing in Africa. Let's move on to the price trends for cashews. As you can see, there is a clear upward trend in prices. A couple of major reasons for this. The key contributors are increase in labor wages and labor prices. And number two, increase in fuel and freight costs. The dips have been on account of short crops in some origins, and in excess crops in some origins, and the spikes have been on account of lower crops in some origins. So basically, the price movements, apart from the upward trend, which is because of inflation and labor costs and freight, the spikes and dips have been because of supply-side disruptions. What does it mean for Olam? For us, it means we need to mechanize so that we try and insulate ourselves from the labor cost increases so that we use less workers for processing more quantity or using the same number of workers for processing double the quantity. We would like to process at source so that you are immune to the freight rate increases. And we would want to secure the supply in Africa because we are seeing that the crops are not really growing. These are the three takeaways from this slide for us. Coming to the long-term trends in cashews, 
a very busy slide, but three or four big takeaways from this. A key trend, the emerging markets will have will become major influencers of the cashew prices. Till now, it has been US and Europe who have been dictating, not really dictating, but uh, moving the prices. Now it will be the emerging markets. Mechanization has to happen. There is no doubt about it. It's a matter of time. The industry has to mechanize, like it is for almonds, like it is for peanuts, like it is for hazels. The crop growth will be a concern area. And processing will move towards the source where the raw nut is grown. These are the four key trends emerging for the future. Let us see how OLAM is positioning itself to participate in these long-term trends. As indicated in the previous slides, the first focus area for us is mechanization. OLAM has been a pioneer in mechanizing cashew processing in the cashew industry, as well as pioneers in processing in Africa. When you saw the processing volumes in various countries, we were the ones who have pioneered processing in Africa. Since mechanization will lead to a lot of generation of cashew pieces, because a machine doesn't really know the size of raw cashew, um, when a machine processes, it breaks the cashews. Uh, uh, the breakage is of an order which is higher percentage as compared to manual processing of cashews, where an individual worker does it. We will need to, we would want to lead the development of cashew growth as ingredients. Just as an example, hazels today are sold, 80% of the hazels are sold as ingredients, but just 20% of cashews are sold as ingredients. 80% of cashews are sold as snacks today, not as ingredients. We will need to promote that. Towards this, we have set up two ingredient processing factories for cashews, one in Vietnam, one in India. Given the crop and production scenario, we would want to so uh, focus on securing supply through outgrower programs, which Dave will take you through under his sustainability uh, presentation. We have a very unique Africa-centric model for cashews in terms of procuring raw cashews and in terms of processing of cashews, and our customers love this. We would want to use this to differentiate at every level in terms of offering a basket to the customers. A very important point is, Given our leadership position in cashews, we would like to take the lead in promoting nutritional research for cashews. A lot of people still believe today that cashew is not as healthy as compared to almonds, but cashew is as healthy as almond, but no research has gone into it. We would want to lead research into crop harvesting, good crop practices, yield improvements, etc., like it happens in almonds. In cashews, because it happens or it grows in emerging markets and because it is a smallholder farm, uh, farming and the industry is highly fragmented, you don't really have such initiatives happening. We as the leader would want to go for it in the longer term. Moving on to some key challenges which we face. In the current core uh, business which we are in, which is origination of raw cashews, processing of cashews and processing of ingredients, we would want to maximize volumes and extract op operating leverage. But cashew is a cash crop. It's a cash product there is no forward market for it in terms of exchange available to hedge your risk. Which is why we would want to secure liquidity and work on liquidity by entering into strategic alliances with our customers so that we can maximize volumes. We have already started working on this, as Ashok will tell you when we reach the next part of the presentation, because strategic alliances are for nuts as a whole. Uh, it might not just be for cashews, it might be for a few nuts. Mechanization for us, Yes, that is the way forward. It will happen. Obviously, it comes with its challenges of generation of pieces, training of workers, availability of technical manpower. That's an industry issue. The industry is sorting it out through better technology and through development of better machines. On a slightly different note, I just wanted to highlight the social impact which we create through cashews because of the unique position of the processing of cashews happening in Africa. For every 650 kilograms of cashew kernels consumed, we generate one year-round job in Africa and in Asia as well because we process in India and Vietnam. OLAM generates 25,000 such jobs. And majority of these jobs are created in rural communities in Africa and Asia where there are very few alternate avenues for employment 
for these workers. These are a few photographs of our mechanical cashew processing facility in Ivory Coast in Africa. This is the view from the gate of the factory. This is the shelling section where the shell from the cashew is removed, the green shell, which we normally never see. This is the peeling section where the cashews are blanched, the inner skin is removed. And this is the area, uh, sterile area, where the finished goods are packed to be shipped to customers across the globe. This is a state-of-the-art mechanized facility approved by almost all our largest customers. So that's all on cashews, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I would now invite Anupam for a deep dive on our peanut business. Thanks. Thanks, Amit. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. As you would have guessed, I would walk you through the peanut business of Alam in the next few slides. Here are some very important facts of the peanut industry on a slide. The world peanut production is 35 million metric tons, by far the largest nut amongst all the nuts by an order of magnitude. And peanut are, peanuts are grown pretty much in every country, barring a handful of very cold countries. More than 150 countries grow peanuts uh, in the world. Unlike other nuts, it's a row crop, and it competes for ground with crops like soya and corn. And the implications of that are that if there's a demand uh, drop or a demand increase, the supply adjusts rather swiftly to any uh, changes on the demand side. It has very diverse usages. 50% of the peanuts which are produced are used for crushing. Other nuts are not crushed in a similar manner. And this is more like vegetable oils, that kind of a usage. And other usage of peanuts are it could be consumed as raw, snack, spreads, confectionery. So one of the dilemmas that we had as an organization is that it's such a huge commodity grown in more than 100 countries, diverse usages. Where do you participate in this business? And the segment that we've identified for ourselves is on the basis of the usage, which is the snack, spread, and confectionery segment. We, this segment is about 4 million metric tons in size, out of which 2.5 million metric tons are traded between countries, and 1.5 million metric tons get consumed locally. And there are very few countries which are in a position to produce peanuts of such high quality. And the peanuts which are used by this kind of industry are very high quality, food safe peanuts, away from the commodity end with possibilities of value addition. They have common processing technology that they share with other nuts. And most importantly, the customers for such product are common with other nuts. And that is the platform on which we have built our peanut business. Here is a brief snapshot of Alam's peanut portfolio. Argentina and U.S. are two big uh, origins for us. We, have, we participate in five growing origins, and these origins comprom uh, comprise about 70% of the world production in peanuts and 90% of the world trade. And most importantly, these are critical origins as far as high-quality peanuts for customers are concerned. As you can see from this uh, table, we are present Right from farming to ingredient manufacturing, we have deep domain expertise in all these areas. We have 10 processing plants across these origins and across the supply chain, which give us global scale and global relevance as far as our customers are concerned. To give you more color on our, the size and scale of the peanut business, the top two pictures are of uh, our farming business in Argentina. We plant 20,000 hectares of peanuts in Argentina. When we say uh, we plant, the lands are not owned by us. We rent the lands for a season, and thereafter, the entire activity is carried out by Olam team. 20,000 hectares, like Ashok mentioned in one of his uh, slides, is about 30% the size of Singapore. And you can grow enough peanuts out of that ground to feed consumption of a country of size of France for a year. 
And then the bottom two slides are one of our shelling plants in Dalmasio Vallas. This is an acquisition that we did in 2008. Since then, the plant is now processing double the quantity it used to process. We have overhauled the food safety standards and now some of the best customers of peanuts come and procure their peanuts from this plant. A very trite strategy, uh, five origins only out of more than 100 origins which grow peanuts, 10 plants, and with that we have built a global scale in peanut business. Moving on to some of the long-term trends in the peanut industry, the mother of all trends is really the consumption of snack spreads and confectionery growing at a pace of 4 to 5 percent in emerging markets. There is a switch which is happening from consumption as raw, uh, low value added raw peanuts to snacks and ingredients. U.S., uh, a large consumer of peanuts as it is, is growing about 2 to 3 percent annually and Europe is stable. Another big trend is China has emerged in the last few years as changed from being the largest exporter of peanuts to being the largest importer of peanuts in the last five years. And given our origin spread, we stand to benefit from both these trends. Uh, but the major benefits or the major beneficiary of this trend is going to be United States, which is, as far as the productivity goes, they are ahead of the productivity curve as compared to the other origins. They have the richest varieties that they can offer to the industry, and their quality standards are very high. The third major trend in the industry is that even the emerging markets are now asking for safety, food safety standards comparable to developed countries. The consumers are very serious about these standards and governments are accordingly responding. So these are three long-term major trends as far as peanut industry is concerned. And the fact that there's a growing demand in our emerging markets and China has turned from being an exporter to an importer of peanuts is also reflected in the price trends if you see for the last 25 years, the prices have moved up from an average of $600 to $1,500, $1,600 a ton currently. Olam's strategy, what are our focus areas to benefit from these trends and to position ourselves for the future? The first thing is that we don't want to expand the geographies that we are present in. We believe that we are in the right origins and we'll consolidate our position in the existing origins. That's one. Second important trend is about the Chinese growth and China potentially opening up the import market. So we have positioned ourselves through marketing offices in China and other emerging countries, and that's an area of focus as far as the business is concerned. The biggest opportunity, however, for us will be in the United States. Like I mentioned before, it is one of the most promising origins as far as peanuts are concerned. We are present in ingredient manufacturing over there. We are present in midstream processing, but we are not present in shelling and upstream. And those are the areas that we will very much like to enter in the next few years whenever the right opportunity is available. We will also like to expand our existing uh, ingredient business in the United States. We have a great customer franchise with some of the largest confectionery manufacturers in the United States. Some of them are going global. They are setting up manufacturing in Asia. They want vendors who can supply similar standard, quality standard ingredients as they are used to back home. There could be possibilities of uh, co-manufacturing for them or uh, custom processing for them. That's another very important growth area that the team is going to be focused on. India consumes most of the peanuts it grows either as crush or raws. And there's a switch which is happening from raw peanuts to snack and ingredient applications. And we are setting up a ingredient manufacturing facility there, a blanching facility to cater to this demand. As far as Argentina and South Africa is concerned, really the big folk, we, we straddle pretty much the entire supply chain there bearing ingredients. And the focus there will be to sweat the existing assets harder and more, uh, make the farming part of our arm more productive and grow the farming business in South Africa. Uh, in closing, I'd like to say that we have a global franchise as far as peanut business is concerned, deemed very valuable by the industry, and that gives us the ability to grow the business either organically, but more importantly, attract uh, very interesting acquisition targets to enhance our supply chain presence in the industry. Thanks. I'll hand over to Ashok for hazelnuts.
All right. Thanks, Anupam. Uh, very quickly, uh, the latest, uh, the newest acquisition that we've had is the hazelnut business for us. But before I get into hazelnuts, uh, I just want to call upon you to focus on two or three messages that has emerged from all the nuts, and that's going to be the same in hazelnuts as well. If you saw the price trends, the prices one way up, mostly, right? Because of the, that's primarily because of the increasing demand that we see from the emerging markets. India and China are beginning to, because of their affluence, growing affluence and the rising middle class population, India and China are able to afford higher protein foods and better, better quality food and nuts because it's a healthy snack and a healthy food finds a greater usage. And therefore, you are seeing a continuing growth in demand, which is why prices are moving up, which is where it's a great industry, industry to be positioned and poised for us in, in Olam. Moving on, on the hazelnuts, clearly there's only one country, which is a big country in hazelnuts, which is Turkey. Turkey produces 70% of global hazelnuts. Yeah? And hazelnuts is mainly consumed as in the confectionery industry in chocolates, in tablet chocolates, and in, in uh, any application with cocoa. And therefore, the major consumption of, of hazelnuts is also in the European Union. 85% of hazelnuts is consumed in the European Union. The rest of the countries are small, as you can see in terms of the production. We have Italy and Spain, which also do some little bit of hazelnuts. And we have Georgia, Azerbaijan, are new, new areas where hazelnuts are being produced and grown. Otherwise, if you see the consumption, you can see everything is Eastern and Western Europe. That's where hazelnuts is consumed. Pretty simple and straightforward business. The price trend, again, simple and straightforward. Turkey calls the shots. There is an inverse relation between price and Turkey hazelnut production, as you can see in this chart. It's inversely related. If you see when the crop is up, the prices come down. When the crop is down, prices go up the world prices for hazelnuts. And therefore, Turkey dominates. And again, the Turkish, Turkish farmer cost forms the flow price for international prices. If you see the long-term trends, similar to the other nuts, emerging markets. The story is all emerging markets, right? Global consumption is growing between 5 to 7 percent. Stable, pretty stable in the European Union. But India and China could be the next big growth markets as all these large confectionaries move on to India and China. All the large confectionaries in the, in the industry are now establishing base in China and in India, and therefore hazelnuts can follow the pathway along with them. Europe will remain a strong consumer with Eastern Europe growing. Of course, Turkey's population is also growing. It's growing by leaps and bounds. Today, it's 75, 75 76 million of people uh, in, in Turkey. They've also now started loving hazelnuts because they produce it there, and the consumption domestically is also going up. And then, there are increased efforts because it is a one origin dominated supply. There is an increasing effort by some of the players in the industry to see whether hazelnuts can be farmed in other new origins like Georgia, Azerbaijan, Chile, Australia. These are other climatic conditions which are suitable for growing hazelnuts. But there you can mechanize because you can get large tracts of land. Hazelnut is similar to the cashew business where in Turkey it's all small holding farmers. Each one has one hectare to two hectares and therefore corporatized farming, mechanized farming, will not be possible. The impact of mechanization is highlighted. If I, if I tell you that the grower in Turkey, whether it's in, uh, in, in hazelnuts or the grower in cashew in Africa, produces between 500 to 800 kilos a hectare. In mechanized farming, you can do three metric tons a hectare. That's the impact of mechanizing and doing it, in a, in a, which, is, which is what the industry in California and Australia produce three to three and a half metric tons a hectare. That is the impact of mechanization in farming and therefore doing large tracts of farming, which is what is not possible in Turkey because it's all small holding farmers. So therefore, there is an increased effort. This is a long-term trend that there's an increased effort to try and grow uh, hazelnuts in Chile, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Australia. Lastly, because of the small holding farmers, there is a sustainability issue in Turkey. And all the major confectioners are worried about it in terms of uh, uh, employment of child labor, for example, in, in Turkey. Uh, and, and therefore, it is very important to develop sustainable supply chains in Turkey. What is our response in Olam? Clearly, simple. 
We want to grow the value-added ingredient processing part. We want to follow our customers into the emerging markets. We want to try and see how, how we can, uh, like in the peanut business, like in the almond business or the cashew business, we would like to follow our customer to these emerging markets. We definitely would like to look at seeing whether we can get into mechanized, corporatized farming in, in new origins like Chile, Georgia, uh, Azerbaijan, and Australia. Definitely, uh, Chile and Australia stack up a little higher because we have presence in Australia in the almond business, as you're aware. And we also have presence in Argentina. Chile is close by, same climatic conditions, same language, same terrain. And we can very easily transfer our skills and knowledge in almond farming into hazelnut farming because they are pretty much similarly farmed. So with that, I will now, these are some of the snaps of our uh, state-of-the-art processing facility that we acquired in, in Turkey. This is in a place called Giresun, beautiful on the Black Sea coast, lovely, slightly on a hilltop, a wonderful place. I would encourage all of you to visit uh, Turkey, a beautiful country, and at the same time visit our factory, state-of-the-art facility in terms of ingredient processing and food safety and quality that we supply to all these large confectioners. I will now hand over to Dave DeFrank, who will talk to you a little about our sustainability initiatives that we undertake in the nuts business. Over to you, Dave. Okay, we're saving the best topic for last uh, uh, because it's one that I'm most passionate about. It's about livelihood and, 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 and the environment and our impact. Uh, the Olam Lively Charter is about each product's commitment to grow our global footprint responsibly. It's comprised of striving to fulfill and integrate the eight principles you see on the screen into our business models. In order to achieve the livelihood charter status, the initiatives must fulfill all these eight principles. Today, we're going to touch on how we are growing responsibly in California and in the Ivory Coast. In California, in California, our sustainability focus has been implementing a mindset where we produce more crop using less inputs, whether it's fertilizer, water, fuel, pesticides, or bees. Our targeted priorities include reducing air pollution emissions, such as dust and greenhouse gases. Some of the things we do, we, we shred our prunings instead of burning them, and then we put them back in the orchard. We convert uh, our pump diesel engines to electric. We also are using bee-friendly pollination practices. For the past several years, there's been a concern about why bees are disappearing or what's causing the bee colony collapse disorder. And Cal California needs two million hives to pollinate the almonds. Our pollination period in almonds is between February and March. And during this period, our team is extremely careful about spraying the orchards with fungicides. We may have to apply two fungicide sprays during this period. The products we use are, are non-neonic, uh, and the products, we use eco-friendly products which prevent fungi diseases, and they, won't, and they won't kill the beneficial insects. We only spray at night when the bees are not active, and we, and we ensure the fungicide is dried and absorbed on the leaf before the bees resume their activity in the morning. The third thing is enhancing soil health. Two years ago, we decided to work on we work, we decided to work with some microbiology experts to gain a better understanding of how enhancing soil biology improves soil porosity and nutrient content. And the fourth is our more crop per drop program. Initially, we applied this concept to measure irrigation efficiency. Now we're applying it to how. Uh, we measure our, our synthetic uh, nitrogen fertilizer applications. From an irrigation perspective, we're finding that soil biology can also improve soil moisture holding capacity. And we also use micro sprinklers and drip irrigations, which is 30, 40, 30 to 40 percent more efficient than flood irrigation. And then we incorporate irrigation soil monitoring uh, devices, which kind of gives us real-time water holding capacities throughout the soil and which improves our, our water efficiency by 8 to 10 percent. For the past two years, with the help of these microbiology experts, we have been testing our more crop per drop program to our nitrogen application across all uh, across our California almond operations. The average age of a California almond farmer is in his late 50s, early 60s. 
UC Davis is one of the best agricultural research schools in the world. And for years, they've provided valuable agronomic advice to growers based on the research. For many years, UC Davis has been advising, advising growers that for every 1,000 pounds of almonds you produce, you need to apply 100 pounds of nitrogen. Last year, UC Davis announced that the growers only need to apply 76 to 85 pounds of nitrogen for every 1,000 pounds of, of uh, almonds you produce. For the past two years, our Chowchilla, on our Chowchilla Ranch, we've been applying 55 pounds of uh, nitrogen for every 1,000 pounds, and our yields are 3,000 pounds per acre. Now, the average yield in California is probably 23, 20, 23 to 24 uh, pounds per acre. So we ask our microbiologist experts, you know, where's the balance of the nitrogen coming from? You know, how, how's this possible? How's this working? You know, and they replied, we are just allowing Mother Nature to do what it's supposed to do. You know, in the soil lives these, these billions of microbes. And these microbes perform a wide range of, of chemical transformations, including breaking down soil organic material. And they excrete these, what they call metabolites. And these metabolites are rich, solubilized nutrients for the plant uptake. So in order to, for these microbes to live, they require two things. They require carbon for energy, and they require nitrogen for the amino acids in the cell structures. So in these soil microbes, need a 24 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio in their food source. Therefore, for every nitrogen they consume, they need to hunt or scavenge 24 carbons in the soil to survive. In addition, these, microbe, these microbes, they, they need a, 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 an environment where the soil pH is, is 6.8. Today, most farming practices only focus on the nitrogen side of it, you know, because of the quick release time. You know, without considering the consolidable carbon source with the microbes for, for the energy. So therefore, when you apply excess nitrogen, it decreases soil pH, it depletes the carbon sources, it reduces the diversity of the number of microbes over a, uh, over a period of time. And, and then over a period of time, what's going to happen is we're going to have a negative impact on the soil fertility. So the, the, for the past two years, our strategy is to increase the soil microbe activity in the soil. So what have we been doing? We've been balancing the, the soil pH. We've been reducing the synthetic nitrogen because we want the microbes to get their nitrogen the way Mother Nature intended them to be, is, and that is to break down the ammonia, which is tied up in the, in the uh, uh, organic matter in the soil. And the, the most important thing we're doing is we're increasing the carbon sources uh, into the soil to get that balance, that 24 to 1. So some of the things that we've been doing, again, is to increase the carbon sources. We're adding cover crops, and we're adding compost. We also use the drip systems to increase the reliability of delivering the right quantity and the right quality of water to the root zone when it needs it. And then through the drip system, we spoon feed our fertilizers these soluble carbon sources and the other nutrients. So what we ended up with was higher yields using less nitrogen. Uh, the more crop per drop program is 20 to 25 cent, 20, 20 to 25 percent cheaper than the conventional method of farming. And then we're improving the health of the trees. Another, here's another example of the uh, uh, growing responsibly. The Ivory Coast Cashew Team has developed a sustainable cashew growers program, which fulfills all eight principles of the Livelihood Charter. Their objectives are aligned with our NGO partners, including the Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to improve the livelihoods in this region. They just finished their second year of the program, and their objectives are to increase the yields from 300 kg hectare to 500 kgs, to increase the farm revenue by $100 a ton from good agricultural practices and establish a traceable cashew supply of 40,000 farmers by 2016. Well, their results after the second year of the program is they increased the registered farmers by 67 percent, they increased their farm, farm suppliers by 56 percent, and they increased their quantity suppliers by 62 percent. Again, these are a few of the examples 
but how you can do well by doing good by growing responsibly. Sorry, guys. The biggest nut has to keep coming back. I won't bore you anymore. I'll just take you to the last conclusion in terms of what is it what does all this mean to us? And what does it mean to you uh, in the audience? And then what are we actually attempting to do? So you can see, what is our competitive advantage? How does all this work together for us? What is our competitive advantage in the nuts portfolio? And how are we building this competitive advantage in the nuts business? You can see that we have a unique portfolio of nuts. We have a unique capability, skills, and deep domain expertise in the nuts business. You can see from the presentations earlier, that we have a global scale, breadth, and depth in our business, which means that we can supply year-round fresh material, fresh crop to all our customers. We can provide them proprietary market intelligence, which our competitors cannot, right? In, we can supply them fresh year-round almonds, so the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere, counter-cyclical crops. So that, that scale and that breadth and depth helps us in being able to be more competitive. The biggest thing for us is we have privileged customer relationships, what we call partner of choice. We believe we are and we want to be the partner of choice for our customers. And what does that mean? It means we have layers of differentiation which we offer to our customers compared to our competition, vendor managed inventory, food safety, traceability, sustainability, and then what have you. We engage with our customers at various levels. It's not about engaging just with the purchase or the buyer. We engage with the R&D to see how, how we can be how can we develop applications? We engage with the production guys to ensure that our quality that we supply to them is, is good and the right quality that they want. Yeah? We engage with also the shipping and logistics and the supply chain guys to ensure that there's a smooth flow of material and their factories don't come to a grinding halt because of lack of supply from us. Right? We also build a deep understanding of the customer, the segment, and therefore we are able to develop what we call applications for them in terms of how can they use a nut better. A simple example would be telling them that today, because of the huge amount of breakages in the cashew business, because of mechanizing, we see the trend that the pieces generation will be much more coming into the future. So we encourage our customers to see how they can promote pieces because they are of a good value for them compared to promoting the holes. So that's a good example of telling our customers where we see the trend and where we see that they can participate and win along with us. We create a barrier to exit. Our customers in Peanuts have been with us for donkey's years. And they find it very difficult to move out of us. Unless we goof up multiple times, it's very difficult for them to exit and find another new supplier. They're so happy dealing with us. The relationship is fantastic. Everything goes like clockwork. And therefore, we create and want to create those barriers to exit for our customer. Finally, I think we provide them supply security because of our global scale and breadth and the depth that we have in our nuts business, we provide them supply security. Every customer wants to know and be sure and comfortable that he's going to get his contract delivered. Because of our geographical spread, for example, if we have a supply disruption in Ivory Coast because of some, some political problems there, which we had two years ago, if, if our competitor was to supply only from Ivory Coast, he wouldn't be able to fulfill his contract. Whereas we were able to supply and fulfill our contracts because we are present in India, Vietnam, and other countries from where we could supply the same quality of cashews to our customer. All this is possible because we have a strong and connected and empowered team with strong entrepreneurial spirit. All the ideas of how to go about doing the business comes because of the entrepreneurial spirit, which Olam is very proud about and we are proud about in, in our nuts business as well. We combine this with embedded strong processes and risk management solutions. Just to give you an example of a risk management solution that we have, our integration across the value chain helps us in being able to manage our risks better. Why? Take the almond, almond business, for example. If you take the almond business, we are in the upstream. So when the market is trending upwards, we tend to make a little bit more money in the upstream because we are the growers. And as I said, the grower appropriates the maximum part of the value chain. Right? But at the same time, it's a commodity market. Prices can come down. Supply, there could be an excess in supply. But because we are present in the ingredient segment, it's far more sticky with the customer. We have created those barriers to exit. We command, uh, and the price is reasonably inelastic at the ingredient level. They use only about 2% of that cashew or the almond or the peanut ingredient in their final product by value. 
it is a very small portion of what goes into the chocolate bar or that or that breakfast cereal of nuts and therefore it is reasonably priced in elastic for that customer because what he wants is food safety quality he wants to ensure that he doesn't have a product recall and he's willing to pay you a premium and therefore at the ingredient level your prices are reasonably sticky and therefore when prices do come down we may take a little bit of a beating at the at the farming level because we are growers of the almonds but we make up some part of it from the ingredient level because prices are sticky because then we are able to compete more appropriately with that customer so that is the point on integration and that's how integration helps us by being present in all parts of the value chain we can manage the situation either way when the markets are up or down and we participate in the supply chain margins as we've always been mentioning and maintaining with you i mentioned about the global presence helping us manage supply chain disruptions our competitive landscape in most of our businesses in the participating segments we have a relative market share in excess of two times to our nearest competitor why is that it's not for any great reason every other competitor of ours is a family owned business they don't have the scale and the breadth and they don't have the ability to be able to scale this up and transfer knowledge and learning from one place to another which only a good corporate can do as a family owned business i can only be either in india or in vietnam or in brazil or in the us i don't have the ability because i don't have the people i have not developed the people and the talent to be able to make it fungible and move across geographies and therefore our second nearest competitor in most of the businesses as a as a as a market share less than half of ours finally the most important way to be able to ensure because like amit said it's a cash product we have no futures market how do we manage the risk in the business we need to have those strategic alliances it's a need for the business to have those strategic alliances with our with our with the customers with our partners so that we are able to hedge our risk and therefore grow our volumes and therefore strategic alliances is the way we want to compete the great example here is cashews are harvested between in the in, in the northern hemisphere they are harvested between february and 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 uh, june yeah we have to buy the cashew between february and june and process it throughout the entire year right until the next february our customers we need to have customers who will take who will off take what we buy at that point in time until next february and therefore we need to have long term contracts with our customers and that's how strategic alliances are useful and helpful for us the famous strategy on a page of olam very quickly there are five strategic planks that we are following driving the core to full potential which will generate the cash flows for us pursue midstream opportunities which is what we spoke to you about in the, in the existing nuts expand upstream possibilities in existing nuts everything the first three are to do with what we are doing today do it better expand into new nut categories which i mentioned to you about pecans walnuts pistachios and extract value across nuts which is extracting synergies from our customers and from our strategic alliances